Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Eric Keller. I um, come from a company called Roche, and in this company we are doing now what patient is next. So the first thing I would like to ask a bit the audience, in this context, what do you think this number is? Anyone in the audience? What could it be? Yes? No. <laughs> that would be... It, it's going in this direction. Somebody else? No, this would be amazing, but no. No. No, it's the amount of tests we conduct with our devices. So let's put this in full screen so you don't see the mouse. So basically, uh, we have, I just summed it up to three types of devices here. Uh, the first one could be integrated in a blood bank. This is a high throughput device. And the second one is something way smaller, which could be at a doctor's office or uh, in an ICU in a hospital. The third one is a coagulation device, which is usually integrated in an hospital. So these are the kind of type of devices. So another question for the audience. What do you think these numbers are? 120,000, 14,000 roughly. Yeah? No. <laughs> That's not good. No. <laughs> uh, no. This is a different relation. This is how the client at Roche, in a perspective of um, development, looks like, or user. So we have 120,000 um, Windows clients, which is uh, the majority, uh, 14,000 roughly uh, Mac kind of users. And we have, and uh, here I can be proud of, starting at 500 deployments of Ubuntu Linux clients. So let's go back to what it means to be global. So we start with a coverage of NADA and EMEA, and it's already deployed in certain sites. So this gives you kind of the context. So coming back to these devices, um, some of them run a dual stack, meaning uh, Debian Linux underneath, so usually the the thing you never never see, and a Windows stack which runs the UI. Uh, all this uh, Debian runs real time because you need to have actors, sensors, and um, it, it orchestrates all kind of the pipetting and the uh, uh, reagents pipetting, so you can perform a test run. Some of the other device, like the Cobas Liat in the middle, is a Linux stack only. So you will have the UI and the uh, underneath operating system as a Debian. So you would ask why in such a landscape of a company would you need a Linux client? And uh, this is just part of the answer, but basically when you develop something for real time, you would like to have real time on your development environment. So Mac was kind of not a good possibility. So that's more or less the latest uh, state or the latest picture of it. And um, here we have kind of a Ubuntu uh, operating system, which is a Roche Linux client. We are talking about this one. And uh, in these small little boxes, you have um, back then it was called LXC. Now it's called LXD. And this run kind of isolated container using all the same shared real time kernels. So that's for the context of the development. But it's not only this. When you want to integrate a new client, you need to do some engineering in a broader scale. So you can imagine, as I started to work by Roche, um, we could not have a Linux client laptop. Because this would mean you need to integrate it to your Wi-Fi infrastructure. We could not work from home because you needed a VPN. So if you wanted to do all this, you needed a, a Windows laptop or a Mac. And this is kind of a summary of what we integrated within this project. So you have, obviously, a real-time kernel we already had before, but it was just running under desktop um, computers. And we have a bunch of security things, like you need to fully encrypt your disk if you have a laptop. Additionally, uh, the mini minimal um, baseline, a security baseline, um, enforced us to have an antivirus. I will come back to this right after. WebEx and Citrix is kind of integration of uh, conferencing and uh, virtualization if you really need a Windows um, application like SAP or others. That's a summary how this was all done. So you have Foreman. 
which is kind of the orchestrator when you say, okay, I need to deploy one new kind of client. It could be a laptop or a desktop. Uh, this is a kind of the central instance. There it all gets started. Then you have uh, aptly. Who in this audience know about aptly? Oh, that's great. That's cool. So this is, this is we choose aptly because it allows us to do some snapshots and publish these snapshots so we can over time reproduce the state of this client. And finally, you have the, the installation um, target, which is in this case, for example, this laptop, which will run the Ubuntu. And uh, the Ansible part, we will go a bit more in details. It means it is configured to be uh, allowed to connect to Roche with Ansible. Here we have a nice overview how the workflow would look like. And you have to imagine we have like a big organization structure. You have like several layers of IT, you have local IT, and the local IT basically is responsible of giving you the resources like a laptop or desktop. So back then, we were not allowed to directly network boot for security reasons. So we had to come up with an idea of using an IPixi USB stick. But this is really a tiny, tiny bit. It's just 1.23 megabytes. So a lot of the people at the AIT service point was asked, where is all the data? It's only one mega, it cannot be, it should be like gigabyte. So when you booted it from this stick, it just consumes all the configuration and templating from Foreman. So the only manual step right now for the people, and we'll go through that uh, right after, is to enter kind of a MAC address on some parameters on who, which user is allowed to log in and have root permission in this, um, in, in this um, target. So after that, it started a pre-seed and um, gets all the packages uh, to be installed from uh, this Aptly server. And additionally, at the end, it will kind of configure the whole system, like installing antivirus, making various configuration. We go through after a bit. So as this take usually 20 minutes from zero to complete deployment, we just started it, and I will go back at the end of the presentation. So let's just jump into uh, how this could look like. So for this use case, we will just do the virtual environment. And uh, here, the only thing which I need to do is to mount, basically, this little pixie boot. So here, it's already mounted as an ISO. And the last piece um, we, we need is a MAC address. So after that, we can create a new host into Foreman. Maybe I need to reconnect. I don't know. Loading along. But I still have an internet. It's good. Demo effect, sorry. This is unfortunate. Anyway. Oh, here we go. So we create a new host. We tell it RSC demo. Here we need to kind of tell what are the specificity of the site you want to deploy. So we have over a certain site right now, and some printers default, some other. Oh, yeah, you need to. Great. Better? Yes. So some, some pretense, therefore, some, some kind of configuration item depends really on the side you are. Um, it's not uniformly kind of a printer system. So if you are in the US, it could be different printers. So we here just say we are close to Basel, which is in Switzerland. And that's where we are going to deploy this uh, VM. Here also, you have kind of the architecture. You just have one. And we have. Um, several kind of variation. We have a desktop environment, and we have what we call a headless, which is basically uh, open to server, uh, but we shouldn't use server. So here we can also decide to encrypt or not encrypt the disk. Obviously, if you want to automate tests, you don't want to encrypt the disk, because then you need to have a way to, to decrypt it. And um, where we have to edit it is uh, you have to paste this MAC address, basically and add some parameters, like which user would be root on this, uh, on, this, 
on this uh, target deploy and we need to define the technical ID for tracking reason. In this regard, it's my server already. Good. Finally, tell this is an unsupported device. Um, demo deploy. I think it's a bit zoomed in. Everything is now. This is also something we needed to add. Some you need to make it uh, kind of easy detection of, of errors. So if uh, one field is missing, you don't want to continue and, and the turnaround would be 20 minutes. Say, oh, I cannot log in. So you, here we just detect that the user ID and the technical ID is the same. This could be potentially uh, some error. So we just warn the end users. Good, good password, just do a random one. Okay, now we can just boot and let's see how fast this goes. Um, it will get this configuration from uh, Foreman and should run uh, unattended the whole rest of the installation. Uh, it goes quite okay. Um, we just have a um, kind of a read instruction uh, because if you do it with an USB stick, um, some pre-seeds tend to detect it as a first disk and then you install it on your USB stick, the grub, and then you cannot boot. So we just notify the user, please disconnect the USB stick and then we are good to go. So this is how the process would look like. I know depending on the network and uh, how fast it is, uh, in a local network it would take roughly 20 minutes. We will not go through this. I will jump back to the slides. And at the end, we will just log in in a, uh, uh, another uh, virtual box we provided yesterday, or provisioned yesterday. Good. Let's um, see what's behind the scene. So uh, we saw the Foreman part. Uh, now let's dig a bit more into Ansible. For all these service instances, we use configuration management with Ansible. And some of these tools are not so automation friendly. You don't want to type your um, partitioning uh, schema into a freshly store or created format. You want to import them from code. And this is basically one of the tools uh, which uh, we created, which is called formal YAML. And you put everything you need for your formal configuration in a YAML file and just swallow it. And then it's configured already. And this, this means everything, like LDAP, everything. So in one command, you can have a full Foreman um, setup. Warnings here, uh, this Foreman YAML um, is not kind of idempotent. I will give you the link where you can have a look at this tool. So this is an example of how the YAML look like. Uh, basically, you can also inject with uh, Jinja some, some parameters if you, if you require. And uh, this is kind of the, um, the IPXC uh, template. Next thing, when you uh, use aptly, um, usually it comes with a really powerful CLI, but you have to do something around. Um, here, um, it's really important. I think I have, yes, I have a better slide here. Mr. Deleted. What is really important is um, you don't want, as soon as Canonical push a package, you don't want every user to have this package already uh, the next uh, couple of hours, because this could lead to several issues. Um, people prevent from working is the worst thing you can happen for your reputation as a client. So what we do is we have a three stage uh, kind of deploy. So people will have uh, the possibility to consume a later stage, which is kind of basically the canonical uh, repository. But you have also uh, a next table, which is a kind of uh, next to be promoted as table, and you have the stable stream. Uh, most of the user will be in the stable stream. So this is just two weeks behind the canonical tree or package deploy. And then you can have, at any point of time, one of these power users using the latest or being uh, in the next stable stream to raise his hand and say, hey, ev everything broke. I cannot do any conferencing anymore. 
So this will then result in a veto, and this veto will stop the deploy to stable. So we reversed a bit the idea of having a kind of a CRB where we decide, oh, um, do we update the repo? No, we, we continuously update, and if something breaks, we just raise our hands. So this is um, a round aptly. Uh, there is a pi aptly, which is kind of uh, also YAML-based uh, definition and how you want to mirror, what you want to mirror, how to snapshot, and how to publish. So this is also something you can have a look at. Uh, at the end, you will see the, the link to the GitHub. Obviously, this is just the call of this pi aptly. So you kind of update the mirror, you snapshot if needed, you publish and you publish updates. And if there is a kind of a promotion lock, it means you don't promote it to stable. This is just a concrete uh, implementation. Good. Coming now to the Ansible part. Uh, here you can have a complete list. This is uh, how my laptop here and how the other uh, virtual machine we started will be getting deployed. Uh, here we can see that there are some roles which are explicitly uh, defined for uh, installing some packages or uh, creating kind of a, a awareness that this laptop uh, belongs to Roche, like the, uh, the message of the day. And you have kind of a site customization and uh, things like uh, VPN or uh, claim AV for the antivirus. And these are specifically tuned uh, for, uh, for Roche to be able to use it. This is how it's called. Um, on the preseed level, the latest command of this preseed will just call this same Ansible. Um, but once it's deployed, you want to regularly apply new things. So this is basically what happens in a uh, daily cron job. So when the user is connected to the, to the just a snippet, when, it, when it's connected to kind of the Roche uh, network, then it will try to update to the latest state. At the end, uh, all the people deployed with stable should have the same version over time. You don't have one having an old version if obviously they are connected. Good. When you deploy it overseas, then a new kind of bunch of problems or challenges occurs because you have your Aptly server, which is just local and in um, Europe, and you have a huge latency to the California Bay. So what we deployed there are some squid proxies. These squid proxies, they are just here to uh, also allow the people from the US to consume the same kind of um, deploy, not taking 40 or one hour, 40 minutes or one hour, but taking also 20 minutes because all the packages are, are cached with a squid, the proxy. Other um, good metrics to have about the deployment is uh, being able to answer the question, how many of your uh, deployed Ubuntu clients have this old kernel? And for doing this, uh, we integrated OS query with file bits reporting to a kind of an elastic uh, stack to be able to kind of uh, answer this kind of question from security when there is a, a big issue. Of, of obviously, you can do much more with OS query and uh, make some statistics about the package installed and so on. As we are in a regulated environment, we cannot just say, yeah, we, we deploy it and we will see uh, if it crashes or not. Uh, so we, we had to ensure that the qualification of the environment is continuously proven. And this is how testing works. So basically, each and every uh, synchronization with Canonical will trigger kind of a new VMware um, image. And, uh, inject the configuration of a REST API to the uh, foreman. Uh, this will go through the normal boot process of staging a new um, RLC or client, and then we run a bunch of molecule tests. Here, I didn't uh, specify the rest of the steps, but obviously what you want to do is inject the results of this in the kind of quality measurement. So we have um, at back then and in the future it will may change. Uh, we have like uh, HPLM, which is then uh, the central place where you can just get your requirements and you can get your tests. And any person at any time can just generate a PDF of it. 
if any of these tests fails, it will prevent promotion and we get alerted. So it means nothing will be broken for the users. Here we come to the lessons learned. Um, so I put just a line at the end which is uh, challenge the status quo and prefer open source tools. And this is not something we can decide at the beginning. So when you start and bootstrap a Linux client in a, in a big corporation, uh, you usually come up with predefined uh, infrastructure. Like antivirus was a must. We had an anti preferred solution antivirus. Uh, this did not uh, cope well with real time. It froze randomly with the laptops or Linux. Uh, at the end, we were um, allowed to use uh, Clem AV. And this is really good, but sometimes Clem AV, if it had a lot of scans to do, it also start to consume 100% of one CPU. And then your fan of your laptop start to be uh, used extensively. So CPU limit is also some kind of um, good remark here. Uh, Pulse Secure, this is a VPN. A VPN uh, guarantees to run under Ubuntu. And when you download the Debian package of them, then you see that you need to repackage it. It has some um, user interactive questions, so you cannot upgrade it seamlessly in, in the cron job. So if some are also using this, I can share most probably the how to repackage it. Uh, Centrify DC, this obviously you want to be single sign-on, use the same uh, infrastructure as the rest of the client. And here also, despite that uh, uh, Centrify supports Linux and Ubuntu, uh, we had to hack our, our way around with PAM because sometimes the PAM stack broke. Uh, some other weird effect is um, when people know, are allowed to work from home from extensive uh, point of time, if they don't connect regularly, the cache does not get updated. But worse than that, if there is a cache problem or a central problem, usually the cache is flushed. And when it's flushed, you cannot log in anymore. So these are the kind of thing you, you get into uh, when you double up on. Um, Foreman automation, um, this is a general remark. Automate as much as you can. Uh, Foreman didn't uh, came uh, with a saying way to load, I don't know, I didn't follow the project so, so closely right, right now, but this is kind of the Foreman for, YAML uh, we talked about before. Aptly, uh, it's great, but if you have like two or three years and a lot of snapshots, uh, be aware that cleaning up the level DB consume a lot of RAM. Um, this is most probably not an Aptly problem, but a level DB problem. Uh, Shore wall, um, this is just a, a side note. It's not that it's not working or so, it's, it's quite uh, quite good. Uh, unfortunately, it's not um, it's not good for any user. It's sometimes really, really complicated to to explain it to some user, basic firewall ruling with Shore wall. And therefore, you get a lot of feedback telling, um, oh, this is too complicated. How do I expose my Docker whatsoever? Um, finally, automation of aptly um, is something um, which you don't want to rewrite over and over. And uh, have a look at this PyAptly uh, source code. So now we can definitely say that uh, time changed. Like even in a big kind of Microsoft affine environment, you can bring in uh, Linux and we can say Roche loves Linux. Here I would like to thank uh, quite some people who participated in it this project, you will see the formal YAML and the PyAptly are uh, developed by a company called Adfinis. And a bunch of these people uh, came and worked with us uh, from the Adfinis side group. Um, that's about it. Uh, if you have any question, this is my light slide. We can ge go back if you have one minute and see how it would look like. Um, in so the pre-seed as expected, not a fast connection I have, uh, is still going on, but this would finish somehow. Um, we have one other running, which I staged yesterday. So what uh, a normal user, when he gets his laptop or his desktop, uh, obviously I already tried to try it out yesterday, but he could just, or we could just do a reboot afterwards. Um, so I'm, I'm going to log in. Um, here, um, a last task that the user needs to do is uh, call a script 
uh, called um, post int. And th this is a bit, maybe it can be uh, beautified in, 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 in the next version, but this, uh, this is necessary because you need a user to log in so you can inject kind of the user um, certificate in the browser. The browser is, depending on the user, home pass. You uh, would like, in this case, it's skipped, but you would like to also uh, deploy a user key per user for the VLAN. So this is, this is basically user uh, specific things. When you execute the script, it also changes the default um, encryption key, and um, then you are good to use it. So this would look like a finished installation. Now, any question? Yep. No, um, what, what we do is um, at least notify the user when Ansible uh, gets broken. Like uh, people uh, are root. Obviously, you don't want to make some ticket to get root access to your client. So uh, you are root, but you have great power, great responsibilities, and sometimes you can also break the system because you do a uh, trip change and then Ansible cannot write and it just crash. When this happens, we just use a pop-up mechanism of uh, of the operating system and say, hey, your Ansible is broken. If you do, do not do know what you did, uh, make a ticket. Or if not, um, fix it. Um, basically, the other uh, way around is when people don't use it for a long period of time, you want to know also. Because this makes, uh, with the time, it gets kind of outdated and it has not the latest uh, uh, kernel or the latest uh, security patches. For the kernel, it's the same. Uh, we intend to track, or at least a basic way, just say how long is the uptime. If the uptime is kind of a month, you should maybe reboot because obviously we, you will get some kernel updates. Any other question? Yep. No, no. Uh, the the idea is, or should I repeat the question? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't repeat the, the previous one. Uh, so are we shipping the Ansible log to uh, Foreman? No, we don't. Uh, what we intend to do in uh, upcoming version is to aggregate all logs into Elastic. So we can have everything in one place. And from there, we can also do specific provider. If some other people use Splunk, we can just forward them to Splunk. So no to Foreman, no. Yep. Oh, back there, there was another question before. Uh, yeah. Yes. So uh, the question was if we roll out certificates to, um, to the machine for Citrix on, on browser. Yes, we do. Uh, so there are different uh, various kind of, of certificate. You want, obviously, to have the um, the certificate so you can browse internal signed certificate from the company and you have also the certificate which allows you to connect to the uh, to the wi-fi these are two you have the machine certificate and kind of the company certificate you need to deploy and this is all deployed uh, by ansible some of the change we did is we packaged this in a debian packages for the kind of the certificate you want to put in etc uh, ssl cert that we just did a, a Debian package because these are not changing so often. Yep. Yes, so the question is why uh, did we not deploy uh, two applets, one in the US and one in the, in the European uh, space? Um, it's we started in Europe and it got more and more popular, so a lot of developers in the US wanted it. And uh, back then, um, we thought about what happens if one of the applets fails to synchronize, because obviously you will hit the US mirror and not the uh, German or the Swiss mirror, and uh, then you need to kind of have a uh, kind of synchronization among these. 
So you could argue also that we could just air sync, but Apply will not really uh, live as an air sync uh, way. So uh, we, we thought about a different approach. Uh, most probably the next step would be to have uh, something in a cloud and use a CDN in front so it's available close to anyone. Uh, but back then we just said that uh, caching is enough for us. And there, as you, uh, you have kind of a tracking of each and every snapshot you did, you can reproduce this environment also in the future. You know that at this period of time, because it's periodically updating uh, every night or every uh, week or every second week, you could follow and recreate. Does it answer your question? Or kind of <laughs> otherwise you, we can we can discuss uh, about this proxy more yes yeah. uh, the snapshots the stable are qu uh, quite long because some system are referring to this snapshot but the rest we just uh, rotate so we don't we don't really need the next stable things or, or latest because this evolves quite fast and you don't want to blow up your level EV for nothing mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes? Um, no, uh, for this, it would be a completely different talk. Um, we started from, um, it was not Debian uh, several years ago. It was something uh, approaching a Yocto, or it was PTX disk, if for, so, for those who know. And uh, we, we did a big shift uh, to use a, a Debian uh, distribution there. And uh, this is also partially, uh, the configuration of your development environment is also extensively using uh, Ansible, yes. But itself, um, it's a mix of Debian and Ansible, and DevComp, and uh, this, this is, this would be a completely different talk, but if you are interested, I can give you more information also. Yes? Yes? So the question was, um, the Centrify has uh, some group policy. I, I'm not really sure. I, I'm not so deep into the Centrify here. Um, is it integrated in our solution? So I can just tell what we do is uh, we have one version which is officially supported and supporting the, the distribution like 1804 LTS or 1604 LTS. And this is kind of a given from uh, Centrify. And uh, we had recently to update the 1604 uh, clients. We still have some of them because they are still supported uh, with the latest Centrify version because we had intended to change the AD version. So it's quite coupled, but we don't update each and every uh, version uh, just automatically because this could break uh, quite easily. So it's a kind of a control change. Any other question? <laughs> okay, you and after you. Um, yes, the question is if we have some secret in the Ansible uh, running on the machine. No, uh, we don't have secret there. We have the secret at the uh, bootstrapping phase. So Foreman kind of uh, has some secret which is just used and if there are a uh, kind of generic user, for example, registering um, an API for getting a certificate from, from, uh, from another system, this gets then deleted. There is no trace at the end. So you won't see any leaked password in your Ansible log and you will not see any logs uh, or, or the user cannot uh, get them, basically. Uh, what can be tricky is uh, when the pre-seed runs, then you could see them as a uh, clear text. But this is usually done in another um, um, uh, area, and uh, these people are kind of trusted. They also have access to Foreman, and uh, maybe in the next version, we will have something like self-service. So if you want to just stage a, a Linux, you, you will be able to, and then we need to think about integrating this to HashiCorp Vault or other solutions. Yes, we have in the back. OK. 
Okay, so the question is if we considered alternative to uh, centrified DC, um, we, at, at the time we did Samba for this, and uh, the AD is quite big. The AD we have is like really big. Uh, so um, it took like 10 to 15 minutes to log in. You could log in. I, I know that this is like four or five years ago, so we should give it a try again. Uh, but then it was definitely um, already used on the server uh, running Red Hat infrastructure, so we, we it was a low-hanging fruit. Uh, but yes, uh, we definitely would like to use something nearer to open source only. Yeah.